place. I don't have a cardigan, but this is my neighborhood and you're in your neighborhood. How are you today? I hope you're well. Come on, cheer up. God is with you today. You're facing a lot. I've had mornings like that. I get up and a huge weight of responsibility or disappointment. But he's the God of all comfort. He's going to comfort you today. May the Lord comfort you today. Come on, we got to go through the day and glorify Christ, do God's will. Soon we're going to go home. And in heaven, every day is a good day. In fact, there's no night. That's interesting. We never have to get up in the morning. I was at the Naval Academy for a year. I had to get up every morning at 6.15. But if I had been put on, on, on report and had to march for an hour, I had to get up at 5. Whoa! I'm not good at getting up real early. That's why I don't like to fish. I don't mind fishing, but then when people say, come on, well, you know when they're biting? At 4.15 in the morning. Well, you know what? Let them bite. Let me sleep. That's the truth. I like to meet people who want to do night fishing or like no mid-afternoon mid fishing, late morning after breakfast fishing. No, they're not biting. Whatever. I'll give it a shot anyway. So uh, the dates in October are the 16th through the 18th for that intensive for leaders. Go to the website. Get involved. Come, come to New York, beautiful, sunny, gorgeous, clean, crime-free, downtown Brooklyn. Never see anything like it. So um, you come and we'll be together, encourage each other. If I just share all the mistakes I've made and the lessons I've learned from that in God's word, I could help a whole lot of people. So now I'm just going to read through this. This part of the story is strictly Old Testament-like, and we're in the New Testament. You will not find anything like this anywhere near the New Testament. So they, Saul is crazy to kill David, King Saul. So Michael says, no, he's ill. They try to kill him at, at his house. But when... Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in the, his bed so that I may kill him. Uh, Saul, you need some counseling. Now he wants the bed brought to him so he can kill him. But when the men entered, there was an idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. She had staged it, you know, like they do in the movies. They make believe there's a body under the, the blanket. Saul said to Michael, his daughter, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? My own daughter. Michael told him, he said to me, David said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? Totally fabrication. But it's the best she could come up with. She wanted to stay in favor with her dad, but she had to cover herself and not say, no, I told him and I warned him and I let him down with a basket. And my shoulder is still strained from letting them down. No, she said, he threatened me. I'm going to kill you. Oh. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel, the prophet at Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. Isn't it good to have a friend that you can talk to who's godly and spiritual? Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul. David is in Naoth at Ramah, Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. Here's the part that's just no comment. I'm just going to read it. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the spirit of God came on Saul's men and they also prophesied. So they were sent there to kill David and now they're prophesying like under the atmosphere of what's happening to Samuel. You're not going to find that anywhere in the New Testament. Uh, Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. In other words, he can't get anybody to kill anyone because they're prophesying. Whatever prophecy meant back then, speaking under the inspiration of God, it would seem, or worshiping God in a special way, or whatever. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. 
Saul's got a hard life. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Siku, S-E-K-U. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naath at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naath at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came even on him, and he walked along, he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. And he lay naked all that day and all that night. This is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? So the way God protected David with Samuel was whoever went to kill him began to prophesy. And they were so caught up in some ecstatic utterance that they couldn't do what they were sent for, sent to do. And even when Saul went, what that means for us today is I have no idea. Except that God is protecting David and Samuel. But you will not find anybody chasing Saul down, uh, Apostle Paul down or Jesus down and they start prophesying. Again, a different covenant, a different way God was dealing with his people and working in the earth. Always remember that. You can't take any promise in the Old Testament or instance in the Old Testament and, and, and say, this is for me, unless it's reiterated and exemplified and repeated in the New Testament. Remember that. It's a simple rule. So when a child curses their parent, uh, you do not stone them, although God said, stone the children who curse their parents. We're living in a different era. I wish we would all understand that. We don't make people kings. We don't run to a prophet to get the word of the Lord. We go to the Bible and we pray, although God can use a New Testament prophet. So, chapter 20, then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. So now we have an example of God's anointed under siege. And even though he runs to his friend, oh, it's good to have a friend. You know, they were, they had a love for each other, a godly love and and allegiance to one another. Do you have anyone that you can go to to pray, to get godly counsel? Do you have anyone? Not, not a posse that just says, yes, you're the best, but who can really open up. To be honest with you, Jonathan here is misguided himself. He doesn't understand how wicked his father is. But the lesson here is God gave David a friend. Without Jonathan, who would David have at this point in his life? So let us thank God for godly friends, loyal friends, a loyal friend, a friend that's born for adversity, one that sticks closer than a brother. We take time, God, to thank you for good friends we've had along the way. And we make us a good friend to someone today in Jesus' name. Help someone today. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.